We saw that uh, we have the old communion and uh, Jesus, Jesus did this for us. He gave his life on Calvary and when he was on Calvary, it is where he washed our what? Our, our sins. We were forgiven. We were reconciled again with God. Actually, I want to say that in Calvary was, that's where, the, 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 in Calvary was the Father's, the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ's greatest demonstration of love for the lost world. He showed his love there for us. So I want to welcome those who are online and those who are worshiping with us. Thank you always for choosing to wash with us. It is very important that uh, we are here in Morsfield. And wherever you are around, if you are far away, listening from far away, come. This church is your home. Maybe you travel from far, you come here. We are near the, the airport, international, rather dorm international airport. And when you come around, you are always welcome. And we have a very good dish. When you come here, you never miss food. You know, we have not only fellowship spiritually, but also we fellowship uh, uh, physically. We have the food that we eat together. That bonds us together. It's a, it's a loving church. So we welcome you to come and worship with us wherever you have time. When you choose to be with us, we don't say no. <laughs> you can still remain. And we thank God for our mom, Grace Palmer. She's always with us here, and she loves to be with us. Thank you so much. So I, I, I am honored today to stand before you. And as you have seen, the topic of my sermon is saved and washed. That's our Lord Jesus saved us and they washed the stains of our sins. You know, you can go and wash, maybe you are, you are forgiven, and, but the stains of our sins can be also be washed and cleansed and then you become somebody. You know, all of us in the morning, maybe in the evening, you went and you washed yourself so that you can be clean. You know, last, uh, yesterday, I was, uh, was it yesterday or the other day? I was called at the Rex Hospital to go and uh, to minister a little bit in the morning. And normally I go at night, but they said, Joseph, do you have time? It's kind of, they like me over there. So they said, can you have, do you have time? And they said, I have time. You know, ministry, because I call it as a ministry. When to sit down with the people over there, and when you sit with the people, you know, you talk with the people, sick people, some of them are going to die. They don't know what's going to happen. So I was called. And uh, they said there was a, 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 a chaplain who went there before the nurse called. And I said, I'm not the marriage. I'm not this guy, this chaplain. So should I come? They said, let me ask them. Because it, it, just, it seems like it went so well with the, with, the, with the patient, with that chaplain. And they just preferred him to come. So I said, OK. But it's not here. He said, but here, it comes only sometimes on call. Like what I do, I go there sometimes when, I, when there's a need, not always I go there. So I, they said, yeah, just, they said, you can come because they need a prayer. And they looks like the patient has been sick for a long time. And uh, so I went over there. And when I went over there, there's a reason to why I'm sharing this story. So when I went there, and then uh, I just, you know, normally I, I, I present my compassionate presence, an anxious, non anxious presence. You know, I sometimes keep quiet, I don't say anything. So, so I, I was there, and, uh, and then I looked at the daughter. The daughter was there, just uh, at the bedside, and they were there. The man is really sick. He was just oozing with pain, a lot of pain. And then I just looked around, and the man heard me. He said, Daddy, the daughter said, Daddy, this is a chaplain. The chaplain is here. Then he said, Ah? He said, That's brother. He's calling. And then I call his name because before I go, I have to know the name, to go to Epic, I check, and everything, what's going on. So I, 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 I looked at him, and I said, and then he struggled to look at me because he's very sick. So I, I positioned myself where he can see me. And then he told the daughter, Can you? 
fix me so that I can stay still, you know, put me. Then the daughter's trouble to put him is a little bit heavy, but very sickly, you know, the body is really going away. So then uh, they positioned him, and he was able to see me, and they opened his eyes. He cannot open his eyes. He told me, Chaplain, yes. And then I said, yes. I said, my name, I have a patch. I said, my name is Chaplain Joseph, and I've come to see you. I've heard that you wanted to see a chaplain, but I'm not married. It's the chaplain that you wanted. I'm a different chaplain. No, I just, uh, just wanted to see, you know. I said, man, I can imagine. How, what you are going through, I can imagine. You know, I, I can't say that I know what you are going through. I don't know, I don't put, I can only imagine. You know, when I come and tell you, oh, Sister Pam, I know, I know what you are going through. I know it's not easy. No, I, how do I know that it's easy? I can only imagine because I cannot wait, I cannot put your shoes. It is you who understands what you are going through. Sometimes we go to comfort, consult people, we go there and we tell them, oh, you know, brother, it will be all right. Who told you that that's what he needs, that person needs? It's going to be all right. God is in control. That time, that's not what somebody needs. You just, they need your presence. You know, when you go there, just sit like you are sitting with uh, Elder Paul, you are sitting with your wife. That, there's a time she just only need you to sit there. Not just talking, just sit there. If you talk, you will provoke her. So you just sit there, just have the presence. It's so powerful. And don't say anything. Because I was, I was given a chaplain to, uh, to, sh to overshadow me, you know, to go with me because it's new. And when I went there, he needs to listen. And I tried, you know, he wants to just keep quiet. So when the patient is talking, he's also injecting in between. No, you don't do that. You just be quiet. You say one word and you let somebody say something. So what I'm saying, the man was so sick, and then, then I asked him, so what do you want? You know, what, what's the big thing? He said, I feel I'm going to die. I said, you are going to die? So that's what you are feeling? Then he said, can you tell me more about it? Then he started talking about he's going to die. You know, he has been sick. The daughter started sharing me. Then he said, daddy, can I share with the chaplain? You know, I said one word. You sure? How are you feeling that you're going to die? So I kept, that's an open, open question. So how are you feeling you're going to die? So I kept quiet. So, and then he started talking, you know, he had not been talking. He started talking to me, he started talking to me, you know, uh, you know, he struggles to talk because it's very secret. Then he said, you know, the heart has a problem, everything, and uh, he feels this way. And the daughter told me, I said, well, how? And then I turned to the daughter, how are you feeling about it? Are you feeling the same way? He said, yes, I feel like that. But what's, what are you thinking about it? Then he started telling me, my prayer is that my dad can live, but now he has been sick for 20 years and he has suffered a lot. But my problem, why I'm painful, I want my, my father to be saved. He's an atheist, he never believed in God. So I am praying that he will be saved. So that's my desire. Then I turned to the man, I said, you man, you are your daughter. You want to die, for sure, because if that's what you want, because you have suffered for long, but that's, the dead is not final. There's always life after death. Your family is concerned, your daughter is concerned that you be saved. What do you think about it? He said, I want to be saved. I want to accept Jesus. And then I led him, I said, say this after me. Because they started telling me how he was a bad man, and those things have been haunting him. And those things have been coming in his mind all through what the parents, the grandparents abused him and all those things. So the, the daughter told me, Daddy, you can allow me to share with the chaplain. You see, there's power in silence. So they started, they started crying, both of them. So after that, they said, you know, I'm talking about being saved. That man accepted Jesus there. And I said that you are lucky, you are blessed. God has blessed you. In regardless of what you have done in the past, what you are going to see when Jesus comes, it is your name. This I say the name, I don't want to say it here. It is your name, and you see the blood of Jesus that is just, just closing all your sins. You are Christ. Your sins, you have been washed by the blood of Jesus. Now you are saved. This man accepted, and I see him smiling when he accepted Jesus Christ. He was an atheist. He never believed in God. But at this dead bed, he accepted Jesus. 
And then I reminded them about the, the, the team at the cross who accepted Jesus at the last minute. So I told the daughter, your father has been forgiven. God has accepted him. Now he's a saved person. His sins have been washed. Now the daughter cried with joy. She was really great. You know, the doctors who were there and all the nurses who were there, I, I ignored them because now I was doing God's business. I was doing God's business. And when this man declared that I'm saved now, and are you sure my, I said you have to believe that your sins have been forgiven? God has accepted you, and he accepted a long time ago. It is you who was running away from God. You resisted God. So I was so happy. I felt so nice. I felt so fulfilled that this man has accepted Jesus Christ. The daughter was rejoicing. I turned to the daughter and said, you must be faithful. You must love God if you want to see your dad. Your dad has accepted, and I see they have ordered barative care. Now the comfort care, now, that means now he has accepted, he has given a concert that's going to do what? It's going to rest. They have already declared that it's going because he has already given a concert that to put all, they remove all those they are doing, and then now he will sleep peacefully. I want to let you know, I've read people there. That's why I love that ministry. I'm not going there. I'm not employed there. I'm not I'm looking for money. But I go there because I want to see people being saved. I say, Lord, I want to see. So when I lead somebody and he accepts Jesus Christ, you remember there is a, a lady who came one time at, uh, when we were on that side. I led also the brother to accept Jesus Christ at the deathbed. And then, then the family they had problems. Uh, they were able to reconcile. Because of Jesus Christ, hallelujah. The love of Jesus Christ. So I told them it doesn't matter how you begin, but how you end. This man has been not been accepting Jesus. And Jesus has, he said, thank you for coming. It is good that you came. It is you God wanted to come because you wanted another person. But he said, it is good that you came. Yes, the other man had a good talk with my dad. But you allowed, my, you, have, you, have, you have led my father to accept Jesus in the name of Jesus. Because we have different goals. That's why I like the elder when you say that you, when you get an opportunity, just hammer it up. Don't give it room. Let people accept Jesus Christ. And let us be always intentional. So I know my goal when I go there. That this is a goal. And they wonder why I'm enjoying more because some people there, some chaplains who are students there, they don't want even to go when they are called because they are afraid. I'm not. I go with boldness. And I'm there, I don't care whether the doctor is there. I give room to the doctor to get away. I, then I stand there, I come in, and then I come in. And then I just look for an opportunity. Because people, if they are going, let them accept Jesus Christ, children of God. Amen. So my friends, let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Now Lord, speak to us. Watch us, Lord. Help us to get opportunities to serve you. Save us, Lord. And thank you for watching us. Now, as I share your word, let me behind the cross so that you can speak to us. And those who are listening, I pray for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, in our walk, in our Christian work, salvation is the fund foundational truth upon which our faith rests. And I want to repeat again. In our Christian work, salvation is the foundational truth upon which our faith rests. It is the assurance that we have been reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, the one who died for us on the cross of Calvary. The one that we are going to do who said, do this for the remembrance of me. However, salvation involves more than just being declared righteous before God. Do you understand what I say here? I say, however, salvation involves more than just being declared righteous before God. It also involves transform a transformative process of cleansing and sanctific sanctification. That's salvation. We have to be cleansed. We have to be sanctified. So today we look into, in, into two aspects, you know, in the, uh, into the three aspects of salvation. That's being saved and being what? Washed. You are being saved and you are being washed. Amen. How are you young people? You are being saved and you are being what? You are being, you are being saved and you are being washed. Being saved and being washed. So number one, and you watch, I'm, not, I'm going to finish very quickly. You know, I don't preach a wrong sermon. Be careful. 
So saved number one, I talk about saved from what? From, from sin's condemnation. We are being saved. You know, when we sin, we were condemned to die. But when Jesus came, he saved us from what? From the sin that condemned us. That's why he died on the Calvary. And that's why he shed his blood. So that you and I, we can do what? We can be saved. So that when you walk, you walk with boldness as we do prayer work today. You walk knowing that you have been saved by Jesus Christ. And you are in the business of allowing other people see Christ in you. You are being saved. You are being washed. All the stains, the stains are being washed away by the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus. So that's why when we read the scripture reading where, where we read, where my brother read there, in 1 John verse, chapter, 1, chapter 1 verse 9, the verse states, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, if we say, Lord, we are sorry, Lord, we have sinned, sometimes we sin and we don't want to accept that we have sinned. You know, friends, when I do something wrong, if I wrong somebody, and somebody has been aggrieved, I go and kneel, I cry to God. I didn't want to hurt this person. I didn't want to do something wrong. Lord, I confess, forgive me. So for so doing that. I don't look at myself, I'm a preacher. I, I cannot make mistakes. So if you feel that I made a mistake, and I did something that you didn't like, maybe I was doing the right way, I thought I'm doing the right way, but it, it, it just really did what? It made something you feel in something else. I go down to my knees and say, Lord, allow me, wash me, cleanse me, Lord Jesus Christ. So the Father says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us from, for, forgive us our sins. He is faithful, our God is faithful. Some people may not be faithful, but our God, the Bible tells us, is faithful and is ready to do what? To forgive our sins. Hallelujah. You know, when I met somebody and they said, I can never forgive that person. I said, why? So it is very hard for me. I said, why is it hard for you? What if Jesus, was, it was hard for Jesus to forgive us? Jesus is ready to forgive us. Why is it hard for you? Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us. And when somebody is telling me, I'm sorry, accept the sorry, please. Because Jesus will say, sorry, Jesus. And Jesus forgave us. And is ready to forgive you. Sometimes I see people say, never. And there are people who are carrying their Bibles to church, but they will never forgive somebody. They are still having some things in their mind. Something is bothering you. You go with it. You know when even somebody wrongs me? Because so, so I'm, I, I feel something that somebody has wronged me. Do you know? And it's not going to repent. It's not going even to converse. It's not going to ask for forgiveness. You know what I do? I get my phone and I call this person because it's also bothering me. Because he wronged me and he doesn't want to say sorry. So what I do, I call him. I say, brother, my sister, you wronged me, but I want to forgive you so that I can be free. Let me tell you, no one is free. When I wronged you, you are thinking of me, and also I wronged you, you know, I wronged you, you are thinking of me, I'm also thinking of you. So all of us, we are struggling with stress. So how do I set myself free to call you? It doesn't matter whether you know, it's that's really Christ. Because he humbled himself, he went down and he cried, and he said, forgive them. Even those who pierce Jesus, the Bible says, they will do what? They will see Jesus. So long as we repent and ask God for forgiveness, he's ready to forgive us, children of God. So the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from what? From all, us from all what? All our unrighteousness. Our unrighteousness. Something, you know, friends, all of us are unrighteous. But when we are in Jesus Christ, he makes us righteous in before people. Hallelujah. That's why when people try to tell you, oh, Joseph, you are a good man. Oh, I have a body of... No, it's not I, but Christ who lives in me. Otherwise, I would be a bad, a bad person. But because Jesus lives in me, it makes me being a good person. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus always is, is at the door knocking. And he wants you to open the door. He wants you to open his, your heart so that when Jesus comes in, he sups with you. He eats with you. And you eat with him. And that when, when Jesus has come in you, you will be able to open up with other, to other people. Hallelujah. 
Because Jesus has welcomed you and you have welcomed. You know, it's the good thing Jesus always is inviting himself. Do you know that? He stands at the door and is knocking. That's Revelation 3, verse 20. You know, he's standing at the door. He's knocking. If you hear his voice and open the door, he will come in and sub it with you and you with him. And therefore, you are not just opening for people, Jesus will come in. When Jesus has come in, the Savior who cleanses us, the one who saved us, he will also allow you, he will make you be welcoming. Hallelujah. Welcome other people in the name of Jesus. Is there. This is this highlights the first aspect of what? Salvation. Being saved from where? From the condemnation of sin, we were condemned already. But because of Jesus Christ, we are set free. Hallelujah. We have been justified. We have been set free by the name of Jesus. So when I walk out here, I don't call, I see myself, myself as a sinner. I see as a saved sinner by the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are being served, we are being cleansed, we are being set free. So when we go around here, we have to look people in the range that they are also candidates for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. That's when we can talk to them and share with them. The same way you have been saved, you want others to be saved. The same way you have been cleansed, you want other people to be cleansed. It is only when Jesus comes and sits with us. It is only when Jesus is in us, that's when we can do so in the name of Jesus. So sin separates us from who? From God. Well, there's always, I always tell people there are only two ways. One way is leading to destruction and one way to the heavenly kingdom. We have Satan and we have Jesus. That's the great controversy. It's always at war. Whether you have Jesus, whether you have the devil. It is only two ways and not only three ways in Jesus. One to Jesus is one way, one to the devil is another way. You either, you are either on this side or you are on this side. But Jesus is ready to wash you, is ready to save you. When he died on Calvary, he died for you, he died for me. So that I can do what? I can be saved. And I thank God for that. It's very important, children of God. So sin separates us from God. And the benefit of, the benefit of sin is internal separation. The benefit, the benefit of sin is what? Internal separation. That's the, the benefit of sin. If the devil wants to separate you forever from God, but God says, I died for you. That's why you are personal ministry here telling us, we need to go. We need to go. And the devil is not happy to hear that we need to go. Because at the moment we go, there's somebody there who's going to accept Jesus Christ. You are being at war with, G with the devil. He's not happy. He wants us to have a status quo. He wants us to sit down, enjoy the whole communion. And then we go out and we go to our house. We want to sleep. The devil, why the devil is so serious out here? Let me tell you. If we will have a strategy, the same, the same strategy the devil has, then we will win the whole world. The devil really, he knows he has no time. He's running up and down trying to separate us from God. Trying to show us that God is not powerful. Trying to show us God, God, why if you love God, why are you going through this? And we can try another way. You know, some people are even forced to, be in the, to, to, to love God. There are people who are just, maybe they, they are, I don't really see. Because they are going with the material things. They want to be blessed. They want to, you know, they want to see some things happen, good things. Jesus himself said, said if you, you love me, are you able to take the, you take from the same cup? And if you want to follow me, you don't follow Jesus so that you can get good stuff. Those who follow Jesus, some of them suffered. Some of them died even very cruel dead when they loved Jesus. Children of God, let me assure you, Jesus has saved us, but he has not saved us so that we can have all what we need, all we want. But we can only have what we need. Hallelujah. Amen. So, you know, you know, having all these material things, you know, I can only imagine people having a lot of things. They have acquired many things. Like I've seen presidents, I've given our president, I saw a young man who was uh, uh, going around and just rebuking the president and just exposing his lies. And, uh, and uh, you know, he said that you have it enough. You know, you get all things from your, your fellow citizens. You are a leader, and I'm getting all what you have, and I'm enriching myself. But one day, there's one common thing. Poor and the rich. When you die, four, six. You go four, six, you know. Eh, eh, six, go down there. You will just die. 
And the good thing, if you believe in Jesus Christ, and this rich man didn't have Jesus Christ, you are the better. Because he will surrender today and, and go to everlasting, everlasting what? Content. Content. And the other one, everlasting life. So what do you choose? It's better for me to struggle in this world. But when Jesus comes, I will be able to rejoice in the name of Jesus. That's the most important thing, children of God. But I'm not saying when you love Jesus, you need to struggle. I always say, Jesus, make me a rich man so that I can bless these people who are suffering around me. Because people are acquiring and acquiring and acquiring and they don't really sympathize with people. They never give you anything. So, but with Jesus, when you are in need, Jesus will do it for you. If only you believe that he's going to do it. You know, the problem we have is believing. And if we believe Jesus is able, he is, he's able. Only the problem we have, we always think negative things about even ourselves. We start remembering what the devil, you know, what how we have come from. What if only you can wait where you have come from to give glory to God? That's better. But if you are just remembering to put you down, ah, yeah, yeah, and then you, yeah, that don't remember that God has already done it. So I say this: we are being saved there, and I, as I said, I have a true, G, uh, true faith in in Jesus Christ. We have offered forgiveness and reconciliation, hallelujah, while the sins is to separate us from God. But through Jesus Christ, we are being offered forgiveness and reconciliation, hallelujah. We are being reconciled with the Father. We are being forgiven only when we are forgiven. You know, if you have not forgiven me, if I wronged you and you have not forgiven me, so can we be, can we be reconciled with each other? No. But it's only when you are forgiven me, and then you have accepted me. Now again, our relationship is at, at none, at none what? I've been amended. Now we are good to go. Hallelujah. Amen. And the titles are all true. You know, that's very important. Now again, I say this point. Salvation is not, is no, is not hand through our own efforts. You understand? Oh, today I go to church so that I can be saved. You know, whatever you do is as a result of salvation. Hallelujah. If you are serving God, you are faithful to God, it is a fruit of being saved in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It is a fruit of salvation. It's not that you are doing this. Oh, I ran to church. Oh, I'm going to do what? So that I can be saved. No, it's not through our own effort. It's the what Jesus has done. Hallelujah. It is what Jesus has done. So I'm saying this. Salvation is not earned through our own efforts or our own works. But it is a gift freely given by what? By God's grace through, through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's why we talk of Jesus. Because he has cleansed us. He has washed us. And he has saved us. I love it so much. God is so good, children of God. Number two, now I go to number two. Washed. I've talked about saved. Now we are being saved now. After you have accepted Jesus Christ. But some stains are there. Because that's why you are remembering all the other things. But you need to be washed completely by Jesus Christ. The Bible says here, you know, I want to say washed from, 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 from sin stain. Now we look at the book of Psalm 51, verse 2, and I will read 9, verse 9. If you have your Bible, you can look at that. So this Psalm 51, verse 2, expresses David's deep repentance. When you have already accepted Jesus, you need, to, uh, you need to repent before you even accept. You have to repent. It talks about uh, deep repentance. D -d look what it says here. Uh, the Bible says, wash me, wash, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities. Now, and we tell God, Jesus Christ, wash me. I want him to wash me so that I can be clean. Hallelujah. Are we, Psalm 51. Are we together, hallelujah, children of God? Are we together? Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus. This is so powerful to me, you know. I don't know to you. This is so powerful. I love it. Because Jesus is talking to us. He says, David, this deep repentance. Wash me. thoroughly from my, my iniquity. My iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. How long how many of us who cry? Nowadays, when we do something wrong, we want to justify ourselves. I did this because of that. I did this because of that. If you could have not said that, I could have not abused you. If you could have not done this, I could not do, I have done this. So we give. But David is crying deep inside in us that I am a sinner. I have sinned against you, Lord. Wash me. 
Thoroughly, you know, you can allow Jesus Christ to come in you, but you are not allowing him to cleanse you, to remove all the cobwebs. You know, when you allow Jesus to come in, you allow him, and you accept Jesus, and then you allow him. You remember when Jesus went to the, to the temple, and there was a wedding, and it was seated there. You remember? That, uh, that, uh, that wedding, uh, the wedding the first, where Jesus performed the first miracle, Ghana, is it Ghana? Ghana? Kana, yeah, Kana, huh? Well, well, yeah, 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 yeah. I was there. I just went there. You know, I, I went there physically. I saw that. So you know, Jesus. Even I saw where Jesus was sat. Sat. You know, he was. He seated at the back there, and the people struggled, struggled. He was there. People were struggling themselves, and they said, "You don't see? He's there. Tell him to do something." Jesus can be in you, but you are doing things on your own. Why can't you allow him to do something for you? Allow Jesus. You say you are a believer and you kept on struggling, struggling. And he says, ask of me. But you have to ask in faith. Not for, from your self-interest. Why am I asking what I'm asking? Why do I need what I need? What is it going to help me to advance God's kingdom? But if I'm doing, oh God give me this so that, you know, I always ask God to give me. And when you give me, I will do the work for you. I promise the way he promises in the Bible. But if I'm looking for myself interest, you know, when, when <laughs> let me share this, and it's not, it's not bad to share this. You know, one time I was in this country, and I was planting churches around. I was, you know, I'm, I was working so hard that I can plant churches. And that time I didn't have the papers, you know. I was a student. So people misinterpreted that I'm doing that so that I can be employed. One of the churches who thought that, you know, I left because they were telling me, you know, they man and it died because I had the vision. They didn't have the vision. So the church grew. The church became full. People, they became so many. They were all as even a company, you know. They were about to be a church. But I told them you didn't have the vision. And it's because they chased me from that church, you know, by what they were saying. And I'm not ashamed to say this. Because they were thinking, they were looking at me from a different perspective. When I was doing God's mission, they were thinking I'm doing it so that I can benefit. And then I told them, you are wrong, that's wrong. The moment they mentioned that I'm doing that so that I can, they said, we want to help you. The elders, they were saying they want to help you so that we can put you papers. I said, that's not the case. So I knew they are going to undermine me. They are going to glorify themselves. And they say, it is because of us, that's why you are this. So what I did, I left. I never went there. Because they were thinking that I was doing to benefit myself. I told them, God has good plans for me. And whatever God has planned, you cannot change it. If God wants me to be staying in this country, no immigration, no even the present Trump, he can do. That's when he was saying he's chasing people. I told him, well, don't panic. If God wants me here, by God's grace, I'll be here. Amen. I don't care. If I go, I never seen back home. Still a country beyond the country of Kenya. That's where I get and again one and again wants to go. It's a beautiful country. So why am I? I, I never seen that, I never did anything. I, but if God wants me to do his work, I will do. I never started, I don't plan churches so that I can be there, so that I can, it can no, Elder Paul, you know that. Even I told you that. I, I'm not doing that. I never look at, and when you start sympathizing with me, I leave you. I don't want people to sympathize with me. I'm a, I'm a child of God. God knows how to feed me. God has my, my ma the master plan as with God. God knows exactly what, where he wants to take me. He never died for me to leave me on the streets. He knows why he blesses me where I am. He knows exactly what. He has my master plan. And he, he just wants me to be faithful as I follow his master plan. Hallelujah. Amen. So I don't have to worry about anything. I said, God, Paul David says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Just allow Jesus to wash you. Allow Jesus to remove all the cobwebs in your life. Many problems we have because we have allowed the devil to take charge of our lives. Allow Jesus to take over. And he will just govern you nicely. He will fix your situation. He will fix your problem at the right way. Just believe it. One lady was telling me one day, uh, somewhere when we were seated somewhere, and she told me, you know, I prepared this for my child, I prepared this, you know, and it kicks it off. I, I, and then I said, it's because you believed that it's going to do so. 
So if you prepare something, if you do something and you believe it's going to happen, it's for sure it will happen. You know, there's always human thinking and psychology. When you believe this is going to be like this, that's why there's power in believing on something, whether it's wrong or right. If you believe it will happen, because you are convicted that it's going to happen. If today you say, I'm going out here and I'm going to meet uh, thieves, uh, robbers, you will for sure you will meet them. Because that's what's in your mind. But if you believe Jesus is going to do this for me, just relax, settle down and leave it for God to do it for you. Hallelujah. Don't struggle to start helping Jesus. Many of us, we try to help Jesus. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this so that this can happen. No. Just what God wants to do, he will do it. Hallelujah. He's a faithful God, children of God. David knew that God, Jesus can wash him. David knew that Jesus can cleanse him from all this. This, this verse speaks to the need for internal cleansing. Internal cleansing. Sin is not only it's not only separates us from what from God, but also leaves us a stain on our souls. You understand what I say? Sin is not only it's not only that it separates us from God, but it, it leaves also what it stains. That's why we need to be washed. It separates us, and you have a stain. It's like something a wound which is remaining there. It needs to be cleansed. It needs to be washed away, children of God. And that's why. See, no, I've said that. So sin, sin, separate, sin I, I've, I've said it's not only. This stain represents a moral impurity and the corruption that the sin brings. You know, there's impunity and all the corruption that sin brings around. That's why we are what we are. You see somebody you think is a man of God. That's why they, wa they wanted to persecute Jesus. Even the leaders of the area, the people who are called Sanhedrins, the people who are Sadducees, those the scribes, the scribes, the scribes, they wanted to kill Jesus because they saw this man is speaking with a lot of authority. Where does he come from? Where this man comes from? Because these people, they thought they knew. They never knew anything. They were blinded, some of us, we said in the lesson. But when you love Jesus, you have to open your eyes. And just allow God to lead you wherever you are. Whether you are a teacher, whether you are a pastor, whether you are a word, wherever you are, allow students, allow Jesus to lead you. Allow him. He will lead you. He will remove, he will remove all the impunities. He will remove the stains from us children of God. It's very, very important for us. Salvation involves not only forgiveness, but also a, a process of spiritual cleansing. We need spiritual cleansing, children of God, so that we can keep on growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, friends, we have not arrived yet. We are still growing. We have not arrived yet. We will get challenges on our, our, on our way, but God is always with us. We allow the Spirit of God to continue leading us. So that we can be cleansed. All the time we are being cleansed. We, sanctification is a process. We are being sanctified day by day. We fall and rise, rise again. We keep on moving in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. It's very, very important, children of God. So I'm saying this. This cleansing is accomplished through what? The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The cleansing is done what? Is accomplished or is accomplished by what? Through the work of what? Of the Holy Spirit. We have to allow the Spirit of God to lead us. When we are going to our prayer work, allow the Spirit. Don't use the Spirit. You can never use the Spirit of God. Amen. You allow the Spirit of God leads you. And if the Spirit of God tells you, speak to this person, speak. You know, sometimes, <laughs> if I go somewhere and I'm not prompted, I say, God, allow me. There are people that I meet and I don't say anything. Because if the Spirit of God has not told me, why am I going to do that? There are people that I want to go, I, I, I force myself, I say, no, this is forcing myself, I don't want to do that. I want to allow the Spirit of God to lead us. And when we allow sincerely the Spirit of God to lead us, we are going to profit, we, we, we will do great things in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, I finish number three, point number three, which is going to be the last. The invitation to come. Jesus already saved, has already saved you. He has already done what? Washed you. He says, come. Sometimes we need to come to Jesus. And just listen. He's, he gives an invitation. Maybe you are far away. He says here in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 8, he says, he, he extends Jesus. God extends his invite, an invitation. He says, come now. 
Let us reason together. Sometimes some of us, we have gone away from God. And we are wondering, you know, we can be Christians. That's why we are preaching in the church. If only we can, you know, if, if we were fully saved and we have nothing wrong, then we are being just nurtured as we continue growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's why we have to do it with a lot of patience. We have to do it with a lot of love because God loves us so much. Hallelujah. So it says here, come, the Bible says, come now, let us reason together. Say the Lord, but all your sins are, are, are like what? Are like scarlet. They shall be done what? They shall be, they shall be as white as snow. There's no sin that God does not forgive. Hallelujah. That's why I was telling this man that I led to accept Jesus Christ the other day. I told him there's nothing, don't remember all those things. When you said you declare that God help me, God save me, God has saved you in the name of Jesus. And now your sins have been cleansed of. Jesus has washed you. And this man, I can see from his face, he became so bright, he was so sickly. But when he accepted Jesus, he started seeing things. Amen. He started, the pain just went. You know, the pain was with his past sin. Because he was remembered. Do you know, friends? When you are at the deathbed and you remember what you have been doing, you have killed people, you have done all these things, it comes there because this is the time you have to meditate and remember, contemplate of what has happened in your life. Because you are no going, not going anywhere, you are not going anywhere. If you have killed people, you will, it will come into your mind. I did this, and it brings a lot of pain. So the pain was coming from all these things. But the moment he accepted Jesus, his personal savior, and they declared, man, I saw him, the face started growing. And it became so strong, he sat down. I said, the, how do you feel the pain? Because I prayed for the pain to go. And they said, I feel better. I feel good. Because you know, he cannot raise his head. The head was like this, and the saliva was going down, you know. He is, he's crying with a lot. But the moment he accepted Jesus Christ, his peace came back. Amen. He came into his normal senses. And I want to tell you, the daughter was crying around with joy. He said, my father has accepted Jesus. He has been an atheist. He has done evil things. But God has forgiven him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, she even wanted to argue me, but I didn't allow, I didn't allow it to happen because I'm in the hospital and, you know, there's so many things, you know. See, you know, they jumped around. I said, glory to God. God is so good. Friends, Jesus has power. There's power in the blood of Jesus. I love Jesus. That's why he invites us. He gives us an invitation. Come. He says, come, let us reason together. It doesn't matter what you have done in your life. It doesn't matter what you go through in your life. Jesus died for us on the cross of Calvary. And he invites us. He says, come, come. Doesn't matter what you have done. Maybe you are just not coming even to church. You have stopped going to church because of what you did and you think God will never forgive you. The same way we say there's things God is a fixer. It's just, he does not want, you have done it, but God says, come. We can still listen together. We can talk together again. We can put things in harmony. I will never throw you. I died for you. The reason, there's a reason why I died for you. I don't want you to get me. That's not, that's, that's not why I created you. I want you to accept me. I want you to reconcile. Come. Come. He gives an invitation. He says, come, let us listen together. So it's the Lord. Although your sins are, are, are like as current, they, they shall be as white as snow. Although they are red like crimson, crimson, they shall be like the wool. They will be white. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter those who are listening to me. It doesn't matter. God says uh, there are some people who want to kill themselves. They want to commit suicide because of what they have done. God says, come, let us listen together. I can wash you. I can save you. I'm ready to save you. It doesn't matter what you have done. Just God is extending an invitation, a very strong invitation. He says, kindly come. Come to me. I died for you. Come to me. Let us reason together. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to go where you are going. Whether you are in drugs, whether you are in war, Jesus says, I can 
cleanse you from that. I know you don't want to be in drugs. You don't want to do what you have. But God, he says, I died for you, my son. I died for you, my daughter. Just come to me. Let us reason together. I'm, I, I want to reconcile you back to me. It doesn't matter what you are going through. But Jesus saying, come. He loves you. He does not want you to get lost. He does not want you to die. This verse underscores the gracious nature of God's offer of salvation. Gracious nature of God's salvation. He says, come. And that's why I'm saying, come. No matter how deep your sins may seem, God is willing to forgive and cleanse us no matter how big your sin is. I don't know what you call big with God. Sin is sin. He wants to forgive you. It's not ready to condemn you, but he wants you to reconcile back to him. Doesn't matter. The invitation to come is an invitation to repentance and faith. It is it's a call of knowledge. Our, our, uh, 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 to acknowledge our sinfulness and trust God and trust Jesus Christ for our salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is ready to forgive us. He died. That's why we do what we do here. We remember what Jesus did. He says, come. We do this to remember what Jesus did. We take the Holy Communion, remembering what Jesus did. And he's ready to forgive us. He's ready to cleanse you. He's ready to do everything. Being saved and washed are two inseparable aspects of salvation. We are saved from what? Condemnation of sin through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are washed from the stains of sin through the works of the Holy Spirit. This salvation is a gift freely offered by God to all who will do what? Who will receive it? Hallelujah. Let us respond to God's invitation with gratitude and faith. Knowing that we are forgiven and cleansed through, through Jesus Christ by his grace in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.